my academic career began in development studies. Um, I wrote a PhD thesis on uh, African development. But as a 24-year-old, uh, I went to Australia. I was educated in the United Kingdom. Uh, but in those days, there weren't, weren't many jobs for young academics. Uh, Britain was in time of economic crisis. Uh, so I went to Australia. And having written a PhD thesis on Africa, Francophone Africa, when I arrived there, it was quite clear that the interests in Australia were more in Asia and Southeast Asia particularly. So I began to retool from my, my first academic experience uh, and I went more broadly into development studies. And the first book I wrote uh, resulted from my postdoctoral fellowship at, at Harvard uh, in the very early 80s. Uh, and this was called Political Development Theory. And it was a reflection on my growing understanding of East Asia uh, and my initial knowledge of Africa. So it was, it was quite comparative. Um, once I came back from Harvard to, to Western Australia, I spent a couple of years there. But then I was appointed to a Department of International Relations uh, in Canberra at the Australian National University. Very eminent department, Headley Ball, J.D.B. Miller, these people. But I had no formal qualification in international relations. And suddenly there I am in an international relations department. Uh, and I was asked to think about Australia in the world. And what I did was I began to think of it more from an economic perspective uh, than a traditional understanding of Australian international relations in security. Uh, and I was very fortunate in having a mentor and a friend, uh, became a very old dear friend of mine, uh, called Susan Strange, uh, who, as you would know, was one of the founders of uh, international political economy when she was professor at the London School of Economics. Uh, and it was Susan uh, who led me in the direction of IPE. So my early work on Australia uh, began to look at Australia as an actor in the international economy rather than as an actor in what was then the Cold War international security environment. So I was taking at that time uh, in the late 80s, uh, along with maybe one or two other people, uh, a different perspective on Australia in international relations, an IPE perspective. Uh, and so it meant that I was something of a novelty, along with a couple of other people, in having this interest in Australia uh, in IPE as opposed to Australia in international security. And that kind of snowballed. And uh, from then on, I worked extensively in the area of international political economy. And it took me into working on international economic relations in East Asia. So I produced one of the very first books along with John Ravenhill and Richard Lever on the international economic relations of the APEC uh, region in 1993, I think. The other thing that I did in that particular time was I worked with a Canadian, uh, Andy Cooper, and we produced a comparative study of Australia and Canada as middle powers in international relations, looking at the economics of, of their their relationships. But of course, academic life isn't just academic life. Other things intervene, family uh, opportunities. And in the early 90s, uh, I finished up going back to Britain, to Great Britain. Never expected it. The reason I went back to Great Britain uh, was we went on a year's fellowship. And while I was there, I was offered a chair at the uh, University of Manchester spent a couple of years there, resigned my, my professorship at ANU, and then became professor of international political economy at the University of Warwick. And I think after Susan and a couple of other people, it was probably the first chair in IPE, or one of the first few, anyway. And we had a, we had a break. We were really lucky. I put in an application for five million pounds, which was a lot of money in those days, uh, to set up the Center for Globalization at the University of Warwick. And for reasons that uh, to this day I don't know the details of, we actually won what was a very contested competition. And we had this money to create this Center for Globalization. So we were really at the, the forefront of early studies in globalization in the 
the mid-1990s. But what gave us our edge was that we also knew a lot for people in Europe about East Asia. And the East Asian financial crisis came along and we were able to adjust and adapt our research agenda in such a way that it gave us, I suppose, an insight into what we might call the downsides of globalization. So we always had a kind of a critical take on globalization in the Center for Globalization at the University of Warwick. And it became a fairly prominent um, center. We hired some fantastic young scholars uh, into it, some of them who went on to be very senior professors of China, senior professors of Japan, Sean Bresden, Chris Hughes, for example, uh, and some brilliant PhD students uh, like um, Helen Nezadurai, who is now professor at Monash uh, in Malaysia in international political economy. And uh, I also have been privileged. One of the things that's helped my life have been my graduate students. Uh, I've had some fabulous graduate students. My first PhD student was Amit Acharya, who went on to be president of the American ISA. And I learned as much from people like Helen and Amitav as they did from me. I always saw my role as a PhD supervisor not as basically dictating what they did intellectually, because within six months, if they don't know more about the subject than you do, then there's something wrong. The role of a PhD supervisor is to provide some guidance, uh, some heavy-handed encouragement at times, deadlines, uh, and to find your students scholarships, money, and jobs. Uh, and I've been lucky, I've had good students and they're my friends as well in, in labor life. Other significant players in international political economy too. Uh, so that's been an important element of an academic career. And if, I mean, if you're embarking on an academic career, I can't stress too strongly how you actually, you're as nice and as supportive as you can to really smart young people um, because they're the next generation. Uh, and they become your friends as well as your colleagues. Uh, and it's one of the rich, rewarding aspects of academic life. The last 10 years of my life, before I came to my contemporary period, was not an entirely satisfactory period. I spent nine years as a senior administrator of a university, as pro-vice-chancellor at Warwick, and then as a vice-chancellor in Australia, which I basically thought was a waste of time. Um, in the sense of I didn't like doing it and the university didn't particularly like me doing it. I'm now delighted to be back as a, an academic, uh, as a research professor. And uh, the projects that I'm working on now uh, reflect my earlier academic interest, particularly my interest in mega regional trade activity. So TTIP, sorry, TPP for example, I, was, I wrote a couple of papers on, uh, and as you know, uh, one of the first things Donald Trump did was to basically close down the, the TPP project. Although it's not entirely dead, but it's not going to be as important as it would be if the US was part of it. Uh, and I was doing some comparative stuff from Brussels on the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership, which is now also uh, in abeyance. But the crucial thing in this current stage of my, uh, my academic interest is we, we secured a, a grant from Horizon 2020, the uh, European Research Funding Agency, to work on cultural and science diplomacy, uh, and particularly on European cultural and science diplomacy. And that's where I am now. I suppose if there's a characteristic of my academic journey, it's that it's not been a case of getting tenure in one university and staying there for the rest of my life. I've actually, much to some people's surprise, I've given up tenure three times. Uh, people get very nervous when, when they do that. But it's meant that I've had this rich career of being able to start in the UK, um, have a substantial career in Australia from lecturer through to professor, spend time in the United States, at the Kennedy School in Harvard in particular, uh, teach in Paris, uh, and now I'm back in, uh, in Europe. So it, it, gives you a, it gives you a comparative perspective on things. The other thing, and I should just say this too, there aren't many advantages to growing old, but one of them is that if you stay around long enough, you begin to see academic 
trends come round again, second, third time. Now, the language will be a little different, uh, and the perspective will be a little different, but they really are the same substantial problems in the study of international politics and international economics that repeat themselves in different, different clothing. My early work as a PhD student was on dependency theory. Well, now to, to, be, to be accurate, it was on post-colonial uh, change in uh, African states, looking at, at the French colonial legacy. But then you go to other parts of the world, and you realize that there are great similarities and differences between the French and the British in that sense. The language disappears, so it becomes, we talk about dependency theory, for example. Uh, and some people, especially graduate students of the London School of Economics in the 70s, uh, were interested in Marxism in, in that kind of way. Um, the language disappears as things happen. So, for example, the, the, that massive growth period in East Asia, you know, when we talked about the miracle of the Knicks, uh, and when we talked about flying geese, uh, and all those kinds of things, that put paid for a while to a lot of the critical dependency uh, analysis. But if we look at the last few years, and particularly since the global financial crisis of, of 2008, and the work of someone like uh, the French economist Thomas Piketty, then a lot of what we were thinking about as grad students in London in the 1970s is very similar to what they're thinking about in the 2010 plus era. It's just that the language uh, is different. So there are great themes that come through academic life. Let me give you another one that I think is interesting nowadays. They used to talk at the turn of the 19th of the early 20th century of, in international relations of the great game, you know, the great struggle between the major great powers. That disappeared, uh, particularly during the Cold War when we had a bipolar situation, and in the initial post-Cold War period where people started to talk about multipolarity, tripolarity, these kinds of things. 2016, 2017, the idea of the great game is back again. Uh, as Donald Trump uh, shifts the United States with his America, make America great again uh, rhetoric, moves away from multilateralism, the idea of collaborative cooperation, collective action problem solving, as China becomes an increasingly stronger player, and as the U.S. focuses on, uh, as Russia tries to, to reassert itself in a Eurasian context, then the great game is back again. And so if you hang around long enough, you see these things come around several times. I, I don't want to say that there's a logic to it. For example, I don't accept Graham Allison's uh, current notion of the Thucydides trap uh, and the idea that just as Thucydides wrote about uh, Athens and Sparta were destined for war, so the United States and China are destined. I don't buy that, that, that particular argument. So there's no automatic logic, but you do see major changes that take place in the, in the global structures, and they are determined very much by individuals. Uh, and you know, I, I don't think yet, I mean, we talk about Donald Trump, for example, and we talk about him in a whole range of ways. Some people talk in a rhetorical way. Some people talk in a very dismissive and, uh, frankly, rude way. Some people laugh at him, think he's a bit of a joke. But <laughs> he's still the president of the world's most powerful nation. He can, he, he's, he's, he can move trends. Uh, and it's clear that, that trends are being moved at this particular time. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, um, and there's no more articulate exponent of it than the dean of this school, uh, Kishore Mahbubani, that the rise of China is changing substantially the way in which global international relations work. It's different to anything I've known in my lifetime. Uh, in a middle level, uh, because of my age, I've grown up with the European project, and I'm a committed uh, European project person, and I think the country of my birth, uh, the UK, has made a catastrophic 
decision. One of the nice things about being an emeritus professor is you don't have to make any uh, pretensions to being a value-free social scientist. Uh, you're not looking for a job, you're not looking for promotion, so you can say what you want. Uh, and I think that what the Brits have done is catastrophic. Uh, and it's been bad for them. Uh, and initially it was bad for Europe, but it's just possible that Europe may pull itself together again because of the exogenous effects of Trumpism, because of the effects of Brexit, because of the ability to try and push back against the European populist agenda, the election of Macron, uh, the, uh, the decline of the AFD in um, Germany, uh, these kinds of things have given Europe a kind of a, a stronger sense of identity in the last six months than it's had for the previous five or six years. Now, this may not last. It may be a, you know, a bit like a, um, a springtime revolution. But if it does at last, and if Merkel and Macron at the center of the European uh, project can bring it together again, then that may re-strengthen it. But it means that in some ways, we are seeing the emergence of what Amitabh, Amitabh Acharya uh, would call the world of regions. And uh, the great thing about the study of international politics and international relations is it's always a work in progress. Uh, in my 40 years from assistant professor to, to where I am now, um, I never cease to wonder at the amount of changes that we think are certainties and then get robbed. I mean, and one that depresses me, quite frankly, as a committed, what we might call liberal interdependence style scholar, uh, what I saw as the progressive development over the last 30 or so years of collective active problem solving, collective action problem solving through, through multilateralism and institution building, uh, I worry for the future of it at the moment. And I think that we are in danger as social scientists of unlearning the importance of institutions. Because uh, institutions do all sorts of things that it sounds boring, but are very important. You know, they build trust, they ensure compliance, they provide knowledge, they enhance transparency, all sorts of things that don't happen individually. They have to happen uh, collectively. And I think that we've got to work very hard over the next few years to counter what I would call the Trumpian tendency away from multilateralism and collective action problem solving. Uh, but that's a personal observation as opposed to a scientific scholarly observation. Well, well technically I've never worked in international security. What happened was I went to a Department of International Relations uh, and my then head of department, uh, the late J.D.B. Miller, said that they had hired me because they thought that my, my work on dependency was interesting. But he wanted me to learn some international relations because I'd never done any as a student. I'd been a development studies uh, student. Uh, and I'd never formally been a political economist. Um, and so the period, my first period at the ANU as a, as a young research fellow, as opposed to later when I was a professor, was very much a formulative time for me. And I found the security literature and my security studies colleagues too certain for my liking. There was a certainty about security studies that if we didn't do this, then this would happen. Uh, if we did this, then this wouldn't happen. Uh, and I, I never had that, sen that sense of security about anything. IPE always struck me as being um, eminently more open focused. And my, my late colleague and friend Susan Strange uh, pointed out to me the, the benefits of thinking eclectically. Uh, one of the big intellectual influences uh, on my life uh, was reading uh, Essays in Trespassing by Albert Hirschman, uh, who basically thought that the way to go was to trespass across disciplinary boundaries. Now, the dilemma for young graduate students is you can't afford the luxury of multidisciplinarity 
you have to focus, you have to specialise, you have to publish in your own discipline. The great joy once you've got tenure is you can go trespassing. You can afford to indulge yourself with other disciplines. So when I ran the Centre for Globalisation at Warwick, we have some very eminent economists in it and some very good political scientists. The economists didn't think I knew anything and the political scientists didn't think I was a political scientist because I was convinced of the importance of the relationship between states uh, and markets. And it was that uncertainty that the relationship between states and markets gave me uh, that made me go in that direction rather than the security of uh, the security specialist, which at the time that I was introduced to it was very much dominated by a realist uh, paradigm. And if we think, for example, about the crises of the last several decades, particularly the Asian financial crisis, which I wrote about, and the effect that that financial crisis had on thinking in Asia, and particularly the global financial crisis of, of 2008, and if we look at the, the, the issues that are in them, then the relationship between politics and economics is fundamental. If you ask yourself, why did the global financial crisis come about, there's what I would call the sins of commission and the sins of omission. The sins of commission were made by economists. Their certainty in the efficient market hypothesis, uh, the idea that you could basically guarantee the future uh, of the markets on the one hand. But we were guilty. The political scientist, the lawyer, the philosopher, we committed what I call the sins of omission. We basically vacated the playing field, uh, the policy playing field, on which the economists dominated. They became the principal intellectual uh, underpinning of global public policy. And it was enshrined in the efficient market hypothesis. Things that lawyers, lawyers and political scientists knew about, regulation, for example, uh, how to balance uh, the excesses of free markets with not without over determining them through excessive regulation. That ceased to be in the debate and that's got us to where the, I think the, the global financial crisis took place because there were no regulatory controls to, to understand. And even since that time, even though we're more sensitive to the nature in, in which markets are basically like automobiles, you know, they need servicing occasionally, the brakes have to work, uh, you, you follow certain rules, like you drive on one side of the road, uh, these kinds of, even though we now recognize that, I still don't think that we've got the balance in the relationship between states and markets in proportion. Uh, and really what we're searching for in the current period is what I would call a Goldilocks theory of regulation. Uh, for those of you who know the, the story of the children's story of Goldilocks and the, the three bears, and there was too hot porridge, too cold porridge, and porridge that was just the right temperature. And that was Goldilocks's porridge. We need a Goldilocks theory of regulation if we don't have one. If we're thinking of IPE, for example, um, Jerry Cohen, eminent IPE scholar, uh, has written this book uh, comparing US and European IPE. And the essence of his argument, which is fundamentally right in a descriptive sense, the essence of his argument is that the US have gone extremely quantitative, uh, whereas the Europeans still remain largely discursive uh, what he didn't really spell out was that one of the nice things about the European literature is it's also underwritten by a very strong empirical narrative. Um, and the balance, I mean, in the US you have a, a kilo of methodology and 10 grams of, of empirical narrative. Um, in Europe, methodologies are often blurred. And, and if I have a concern about European IPE is that young graduate students do not think it's important to know economics. It is. It's not sufficient to read Gramsci, discover social forces, and call yourself an IPE scholar.
you have to understand the basics of economics uh, to be an IPE scholar. Um, and so th there's that what's called the transatlantic divide, uh, and it's reflected in the, 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 the traditions in Europe and North America. One much more um, tightly quantitatively analytically focused, and the other much more narrative discursive based. Although these have to be identified as general characteristics, not hard and fast rules for everybody. Well, the most interesting, but the most difficult, is how you do genuine multidisciplinary work. Not transdisciplinary, not dipping your toe into economics or, or pol sci, but how you genuinely bring them together when the constraints on bringing them together are so strong. For example, the sociology of the disciplines dictates that thou shall not commit uh, multidisciplinary love. Uh, it's kind of anti-professional. Uh, economists, uh, their careers are very strongly determined and focused by their ability and their speciality uh, and their technical expertise uh, in economics. Doing cooperative work with political scientists is, if it's not formally frowned upon, it's not basically a great career booster. On the other side of the, the, the fence, uh, very often the, the, the technical difference between economics and political science means that it's unlikely, unless you are a political scientist who considers yourself to be a second-rate economist, uh, it's very unlikely that you do interdisciplinary work. Um, although it's less likely to blight your career uh, if you do. But of course, as one of my very close economics friends said, he said, we in economi economics, we have all the good answers. But you in political science, you have all the good questions. Uh, and the problem is, you can't answer the good questions uh, just technically, because there are bigger philosophical, normative, and political issues to be dealt with. And I think that, that, that there's a case for the other social sciences, particularly law, particularly political philosophy, particularly political science, not to feel intimida intimidated by the economics fraternity. And the only way you can do that very often is if you're tenured and senior, um, because academic life, as I'm sure as PhD students you're beginning to find out, is very competitive, and particularly in the early stages of, of your career. So that's the big, if you like, methodological and professional problem. The big questions. The great questions of this world are still unanswered. Uh, and they're to do with degrees. And one of them, of course, is equality and inequality. How much inequality is tolerable in the interests of overall aggregate welfare growth? And of course, if we look at what's happening in contemporary world politics at the moment, we look at the rise of populism, uh, the Le Pen phenomena, admittedly somewhat tarnished now in France, uh, the arrival of Donald Trump uh, in the United States, uh, the Wilders phenomena in the Netherlands, uh, the decision by the Brits uh, to vote for Brexit. Uh, all of these things revolve around two issues. One is identity, uh, concern about too many migrants, these kinds of things. The second one is inequality. Where do you get your living and well-being from if your jobs are disappearing? Uh, and one of the fundamental misunderstandings, I think, that's caused the globalization backlash is that liberal free trade is the cause of massive unemployment uh, and job losses in diminishing manufacturing sectors. It underestimates entirely the impact of technology, robotization. Uh, where the mistake was committed is that those groups that were the major beneficiaries of globalization actually ignored or thought the problems of the growing dispossessed 
in the manufacturing sectors would be dealt with by job growth in other areas. But of course, as we know, this has not happened. Those people who were forced out of work in the sunset industries are not the people, especially white male workers in the industrial, declining industrial sectors of the US and Europe. These people did not find their way into the new job growth in the high tech sector and in the service uh, industries. And of course, this lent very nicely to populist, uh, in some ways, in some cases, demagogic uh, political leaders being able to galvanize their support by saying that it's all the problem of the globalizing elites and globalization that you're in this difficult position now. Now, at one level, they got a point. They didn't have a point in saying that it was globalization that was causing it, but they did have a point in saying that the, the major beneficiaries of globalization ignored the need to look to compensatory, compensatory welfare mechanisms to underwrite those people who were in the and so what we've seen in the dispossessed classes. So what we've seen is in some ways a separation of the relationship between the citizen and the state in the modern democracy. That social bond that existed where citizens ex accepted the role of the state in return for guaranteeing their, their basic minimums, not equality, but their basic minimums, um, have disappeared. And just to be slightly personal about this, this is now one of the major obvious debates in globalization. Everyone talks about this now. I wrote an article in 1999 with a friend of mine called Richard Devatak, published in International Affairs in 1999, that foreshadowed this break in the social bond between the state and the citizenship 20 years before people started talking about it. Let's, let's try and separate them out. Multilateralism uh, is essentially a post-World War II phenomenon. Uh, it was underwritten by the United States at its finest uh, as a self-binding hegemon. Uh, it underwrote the system uh, even when it was so powerful that it didn't need to underwrite the system. Uh, and it basically in in introduced a set of norms and principles Admittedly, uh, along with the influence of people like Maynard Keynes and the, the growth of the Bretton Woods system, uh, GATT, these kinds of things, the UN, uh, and it, it played a self-binding role in it. And so that gave us the, the growth of multilateralism, a recognition that we needed to solve problems collectively, uh, that we needed an institutional setting uh, in which to do it. Regionalism. Uh, is a slightly different phenomena. Uh, and we've seen in Latin America and East Asia, and initially in Europe, of course, um, impetus for regionalism. Regionalism in Europe was obvious, uh, driven by the French and the Germans. It was an attempt to create a post-World War II settlement that made sure that we didn't see Europe go to war again for a third time in a, in a hundred years. And from that, we had the, the European project with its progress progressive deepening and expanding through to where we are now with the Europe of 28, 27 when the Brits uh, leave, uh, with a, a not very well functioning Eurozone, but nevertheless an attempt uh, to do it, uh, and with a kind of a, a Cartesian formal process of integration. Asia, of course. Um, ASEAN, ASEAN is how many years old now? 50, is it 50 years old? Nearly? Almost, yeah. ASEAN, of course, um, I'm not sitting in the Lee Kuan Yew School going to explain the development of ASEAN because there are at least 100 people in this place who can do it better than me. Uh, but it, it always had a different philo philosophy that, that underpinned it. It was built on consensus, the ASEAN way, those kinds of things. Uh, and as the, the late Nordin Sopi, very eminent Malaysian student of uh, Southeast Asia, Malaysia's first uh, 
PhD graduate from the School of Economics, told me once over dinner, take your Cartesian legal formalism back to Europe. We do not want it and we do not need it uh, in East Asia. So the development of regionalism in East Asia has been a different activity. Uh, it's been much more plural. There are so many levels, the East Asian Summit, um, uh, ASEAN Plus Three, APEC, uh, now attempts to create uh, RCEP, etc. Things that I used to know a lot about but don't know much about anymore, so I will contain my conversation. But it's a different process. Now, the last part of the question, to what extent are globalization and regionalism, they are basically the two sides of the same coin. Uh, and regionalism is both defensive and offensive. Uh, you gather regionally to defend yourself against what you think are the, the pressures from globalization, but you also try to use regionalism as a springboard to enhance your position in, in the global context. Well, if I'm guilty of one thing as a student of IPE, I think it's probably that I've reduced to a secondary position the issue of identity. Um, in part, I think that's because I lived in Australia for 20 formative years of my academic life, which was one of the world's most successful cosmopolitan uh, experiences. Uh, the integration of Italians, Greeks, uh, Vietnamese, Chinese into the Australian community all went really rather well. Uh, since going back to Europe, I've recognized the degree to which identity still remains a major issue. Uh, and the problem with identity is not that individuals or people are innately oppositional or xenophobic to other identities is the combination of identity and equal opportunity uh, and welfare that creates it. So in Europe at the moment, uh, everyone who feels part of that kind of dispossessed community, difficult to find jobs, low standards of living, um, it's not difficult for politicians who want to, to say, well, that's all the fault of the, the immigrants, of the refugees. So y it's, it's not identity per se, it's the combination of identity and economic inequality that generates the tensions in Europe. Uh, in Asia, clearly there are historical things. The uh, role of Japanese aggression, for example, in the first half of the 20th century that leave legacies, uh, traditional rivalries between various parts of, of the regions. But you have to say that ASEAN is managing those identity differences quite well in some ways. Now, that's a diff it's an interesting question. It's a different one. Just briefly, the, the project that we're working on at the moment, it's a European Union funded project and it emanates from their High Horizon 2020 research uh, agenda. And it's an investigation of the degree to which enhancing cultural relations, international cultural relations, or cultural diplomacy as it's often called, and science diplomacy can basically engage Europe uh, more strongly in the world and can enhance Europe's international relations. It's underwritten by a view that Europe's major international strength is not as a security actor, uh, but as one as an economic actor uh, and as what you might call a normative power. Um, there is this assumption that European values are much sought after. I think it's a questionable assumption. Um, there is this assumption that uh, if you engage culturally, you enhance relations, mitigate strains and tensions. So our project is exploring, we're not advocating, we're exploring the degree to which enhanced cultural relations and science diplomacy can enhance European uh, engagement. Uh, but of course the normative assumption that underpins it and that the funding agency uh, clearly wants us to, to, to establish, if we can, is that this improves and helps relations. 
And at one level, you can say it does. If you think, for example, about the end of the Cold War, then as much as it was Ronald Reagan uh, arms racing, out arms racing the Russians uh, in the military sphere, it was also the impact of technology, the communications revolution and globalization, that meant that people in East and Central Europe behind the Iron Curtain could see what they were missing. You know, they, they couldn't get the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Levi Jeans or all those cultural manifestations of Western prosperity. So there's a very interesting tension between security and culture uh, in that sense. And if you can play the culture game well, then in theory you enhance. I mean, if you ask the what's put Korea on the map, South Korea on the map in the last few years, it's been that what I as a, an old man find quite bizarre music. What's it called? Gang gang music or gang bang music or? But it's it's been really a major issue uh, in giving Korea an international presence. Um, so culture in that sense is important. And there are all sorts of elements of cultural diplomacy, which range from art, literature, music, film, uh, through to food. People talk about gastro diplomacy uh, nowadays. The interesting issue is the degree of difference between cultural relations and cultural diplomacy. And the central question in defining that is the role of the state, the role of the foreign office, or in the European context, the role of uh, European External Relations, um, EAS. And um, this is a work in progress. Um, we're, we're not sure which direction it's going yet. I really have to explain how small this world is. One of JJ's PhD examiners was Diane Stone. Um, so we're sitting having breakfast one day, and Diane says, I've just read this really good PhD thesis. And she told me what it was about. And so when I came to this conference, I made a point of talking to JJ. Uh, and what was really interesting was he had this public policy take, and I had this IPE take. And we said, let's write a paper that looks at how IPE might be able to enhance public policy. Uh, and how IPE might learn from public policy. And what we found was that the, the clear strengths of IPE, particularly its macro global structure, its discussion of the relationship between the state and the market, uh, offered a, a context for understanding transnational, trans-sovereign, global public policy. Call it what you want. Uh, but how public policy, in some ways, had much more interesting policy design and applied policy tools than existed in IPE. Uh, and so what we thought we'd try and do, basically, you know, as a, to open a conversation with our colleagues in, in both areas, was see to what extent we could, we could map these two uh, competing strengths onto each other. And that was the essence of the paper. Now, I suppose that the proof of the paper will be the degree to which students of IPE say, oh, this is interesting. I think I want to know a bit more about how policy is made. Um, because there's always been this assumption among students of IPE that policy people operate with what um, is often referred to as nationalist methodologies, working within the the confines of the state, where students of IPE are working outside the state. And so rather than seeing the, the state as a, a conductor between the global and the domestic, it's seen as a barrier. Uh, and so efforts to try and transcend that. Uh, and of course, we're, we're not unique here. Lots of people have said this. Uh, and if you think about the debate in IPE in the United States uh, in the 90s, uh, triggered by the work of people like Helen Milner and Bob Gahane. It was always about that national, international dimension. But, and this is where I get myself into trouble with Professor Stone, I think that the public policy community 
is much more reluctant to think outside of the, the national box. They're getting better, and her and her colleagues are pioneers uh, in, in this field. But it is still an issue in the relationship between the study of public admin and public policy on the one hand, and international relations and IPE on the other. And I just don't think it's sustainable. But it's a classic example of where the sociology of the professions kicks in and where your peer reward, how do you get promoted? You publish in the mainstream journals. In, so if you want to get promoted in international relations, you publish in international organization, world politics, review in national political economy, international affairs, review in national studies, etc. If you want to get published in, you want to get a career in public administration, there's a, another set of journals that, that you focus on. And these things, peer reward and promotion, tend to constrain that kind of public. Very brave of JJ as a young assistant professor, just out of PhD, to, to write a paper with a, an old hack uh, like, like me. So uh, I hope it doesn't do him any harm. I think that there's always, because IPE is a field of inquiry, there's always a debate about what is a discipline and what is a field. International relations think they're a discipline. I don't think international relations is a discipline. Uh, it's a broader field of inquiry than, I are, than IPE, but it's still a field of inquiry. Uh, and it should bring different methods to bear, historical, modern, analytical, etc. Uh, because IPE is clearly a field of inquiry, which tries to, to operate uh, the interstices, interstices of uh, politics and economics, states and markets. It's always been more open to trespassing, to use Albert Hirschman's metaphor, than some, some other disciplines. Um, I think that, the, the, and the reason I, this is, I've been to all of these conferences. This is the third IPP conference I've been to is that what I really like about it is that there is a spirit of intellectual openness amongst the people here. So I, I wouldn't want to say that one is open and the other is closed. I would want to say that there is a, you know, the beginnings of a genuine discussion taking place. Well, as students of IPE will know, for, for a good decade or two decades, we were influenced by a single expression from one scholar, um, a very good scholar, a man I admire immensely, uh, called Robert Cox. And, and Robert Cox distinguished between IPE as critical theory and IPE as problem solving. And this, I think at the time, reflected the literature but of course, the fact that it reflected the literature meant that it elided the major problem, is that critical theory and problem solving shouldn't be two sides of a fence. They should, to the extent that we can, unite them. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that IPE has always thought of itself much more as analytical and critical than it has applied and problem solving. Public policy, of course, is very much an applied discipline. And so, what I think we need to do in the future, and it's not easy, uh, and I'm certainly too old to do it. You can't teach old dogs new tricks. But younger generation PhD students like yourself, uh, it seems to me, need to ask the question, uh, how do we take uh, the best of what we might call a critical analytical perspective uh, as a means of trying to develop uh, applied problem solving uh, methodologies to them. If we're going to have any utility, if we're not simply going to fall back uh, on the economist every time as a principal uh, figure in applied public policy, then public policy and IPE need to be a lot more intellectually simpatico and transferable. Well, you build your academic identity by being good. I mean, one of the, and I'll get shot for saying this, one of the questions we need to think about, are we producing too many PhDs?
for example, uh, does the nature of the PhD have to change? I think the nature of the PhD in the policy school uh, is developing in, in quite a progressive way. I think that my preference is not for schools of public policy or for schools of international affairs, but for schools of public policy and international affairs. Uh, the APSEA school system in the US, for example, a lot of them are put schools of public and international affairs. Uh, each school will, will deliver their mode of instruction in different ways. But it seems to me there are basics that scholars coming out with PhDs in public policy and international affairs need to have. It's not sufficient nowadays to turn anyone out with a PhD in international relations who doesn't know any economics. It's not sufficient to turn out students of public policy who don't know any history. Uh, I mean, part of the problem we have with a lot of the policy-making models is that they are absolutely historical. Uh, sorry, a-historical. So there are elements, obviously, history, economics. Then, of course, the various areas of international relations and public policy um, will, I think, create more reflective PhD outputs. The other thing that we've got to do, and this is again to come back for the third time to the sociology of professions, we have got to make sure that multidisciplinary work uh, does not inhibit career progression. Uh, I mean, I've, when I was Pro Vice Chancellor at Warwick, I sat on lots of appointment panels uh, in finance uh, and economics, for example. And someone with two papers in the American Economic Review would be shortlisted for a chair where someone with a, a big book probably wouldn't uh, because it was the reward system uh, that worked. Uh, if you asked a finance assistant professor of finance, talk about anything other than their model, they would have difficulty. They had such a level of specialization that they, they found it difficult to communicate in a wider way. So we have to turn out good communicators as well.